the book review podcast where the books are split in two and figuring out just what is going on is always a toss-up i'm taylor and i'm jonathan this episode we are finishing tuesday mooney talks to ghosts by kate Raculia. uh taylor how are you feeling uh, now that we've hit the end of this book i'm feeling like it all went downhill oh no that's all what about you oh, okay <laughs> sure yeah i i feel like you know, I was really excited for a puzzle book because <laughs> that's what I was looking for here. Mm-hmm. And I just don't feel like that's what I got, especially like the the parts right where we left off at the last episode where that first part of that section was just not really the puzzle at all. And we eventually come back to it and it just it didn't it didn't really fulfill what I was looking for, unfortunately. So but let's uh, let's just go go ahead and get right into it. So since since I mentioned the puzzle, let's go ahead and start there. Yeah, we'll we'll start with our epic treasure hunt, which is what was <laughs> yes. promised to us. So where we uh, left off was everybody had the packets, basically everybody, and there were the cards inside, and we were left with the message: a seeker can play their hand with the widow, and that's kind of where we were, like. We didn't really know what that meant. Mm. Um, I had ideas that the missing card was the ace connected to the ace company. It could still work out that way. Tuesday obviously did not have that thought because she did nothing (laughs) in relation to that. (laughs) Um, To be honest, she didn't do any puzzle solving with this at all. And even when she did, we didn't see it. So the book became very casual about the puzzle at this point, almost like it didn't exist. But also it kind of didn't exist after that point. Like and and I think it was even publicly announced, like if you seek counsel with the widow, like in the like final funeral announcement, which made the whole puzzle up to this point. I mean, useful because you needed, I guess, a card to do it, but otherwise not because it wasn't a secret. It wasn't really like they found out anything unique. (laughs) They just found it first um, which i guess puzzle competitions are often who found it first but it didn't feel particularly interesting yeah especially because like i was still trying to solve something right like i thought the widow might have been uh constance instead of uh, instead of lila oh and that's what the ace was referring to instead Mm. because she's the one leading the company and like obviously constance mattered a lot to vince i have a lot of thoughts on that but Mm -hmm. I thought there was just something more clever going to be happening, especially because the cards were the cards were unique. Like they were custom printed cards, they were clock like, like there was clock imagery happening a lot. And and then it just didn't fucking matter. It didn't fucking matter. <laughs> and I was wasting it was just my a time. Complicated reference to Archie, right? I I'm not even sure. Because <laughs> like that must be the only thing, right? If it was an ace that was missing and like we're making the arches connection, like it's probably just that Archie got a free pass in. But like the problem, I thought that too. But my problem with that is he could have taken a packet like he was there. Yeah, that's true. He just so happened to not. Right. It was coincidence that he didn't. And leaving something up to coincidence feels so messy. When most of what's happening until we get to the end of the book, most of what's happening feels so very detailed. Mm-hmm. So in my head, Archie isn't the ace because he could have taken a card. I'm thinking Edgar was the ace. Mm. He was the missing ace. That makes a lot of sense, actually. <laughs> I, I can still see it just because I don't think Vince cares if Archie like takes a card or not. Like I think it's more about the message. Yeah, I could agree with that, too. I think it go, could go either way. Yeah, but I, I, yeah, that's the thing. I do. It almost feels like it goes for both. Like, yeah, like there's a missing arches, so it would make sense that there's a missing ace, mm-hmm. and that would be Big Edgar. And then there's also like, you know, we're we're distributing these fifty one cards because the people who get them have a chance to pass the game. We don't need this ace because we already have an ace who's already in. Yeah, the Archie one is just especially sloppy. Yeah, but I feel like when this puzzle starts to become more about this true crime element, it is just sloppy. Like. It has the possibility of going wrong, but so does the entire end of this fucking puzzle. So fuck me. Yeah, there's a lot of confidence from living Vince on this game working out as he expects it to. Yeah. When it's like not so structured. Which is annoying because there's so many elements of it that feel structured. Like we have the banker and we even have the blackmailer. Like we have (laughs) so many pieces that feel exact. But then there's extra shit added in that doesn't get resolved. 
yeah. and feels pointless. So it's like, Ugh. did you want a clean puzzle treasure hunt or not? I guess fucking yeah. not. Fuck me, I guess. I, no, I agree. Like, I very much, a uh, classic case of had me in the first half because at the beginning of the book, it totally seems like it's going to be that kind of puzzle. Like, you're going to follow along. Like, where the puzzle is written for the reader too, but the puzzle in this case didn't feel like it was written for us. We we're reading about the people who it was written for. <laughs> so it didn't give us much to, to go along with. It didn't matter if it was structured and there was a specific path to take in the end because it actually wasn't for us to figure out, which is disappointing. Yeah, it just shouldn't have been a puzzle. Like mm -hmm. it could have been trying to like reveal the true crime element of it, but then like, it's just like, you wanted a game inside a game, I get it, but at least make the game clever. Mm -hmm. At least make it, I don't know, more, I, 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 I don't know how to like articulate what I wanted, but it wasn't what happened, <laughs> I guess. I agree. No, it, it did feel like there was room for it potentially to work if, the, to me, if the puzzle it, that everyone else was playing and not like Vince and the Arches, that if that part was a little, a little more cared for, then maybe the second puzzle behind it would have seemed cooler even if it was just otherwise the same but i just think that the the puzzle that was facing the public wasn't like it wasn't enough it wasn't good i'll fucking say it it was shit <laughs> like it seemed fun in the first bit with dory what yeah. dory had going on but after that it was basically random right like we were lucky dex knew about the underground theater and maybe tuesday could have figured it out with enough research but like that was the end. That was the end of the game. Mm -hmm. No, it was. It totally was, was the end of the no game. No research needed after that. There was no need for Dory to like manipulate and like try to be clever because it didn't fucking matter. Like what cards people had, it didn't matter. There was a card missing, didn't matter. You had thirteen thousand dollars. I guess alluding to thirteen <laughs> people getting chosen didn't matter. Yeah. You get to the Tillerman house and there's pillars and like everybody seems to have their place. Didn't fucking matter. Like I'm yeah. so i'm livid <laughs> i'm sorry oh no oh no <laughs> we need to stop i need to move on let's 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 uh get into the next thing before we <laughs> get too far ahead of ourselves so okay so where did we even start with that so we talked about the puzzle and the message we talked about them getting the cards okay cool so tuesday go ahead it goes ahead and uh gets fired <laughs> via some help from information from actual nathaniel which like Tuesday's like, wow, I'm so targeted. Like he came for me. What did he guys what did he do to make you guys fire me? And they're like, actually you just broke all the rules. Honestly, I was gagged. That was crazy <laughs> shit. She thought she was so fucking important. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Like and she totally did break all the rules. And like her fake justifying it when she did it the first time was so silly. And I actually thought that that was gonna stand. Like I didn't actually think this the she would get fired because there's this like very strong um there's a lot of Tuesday confidence in this book <laughs> of like I know how to like manipulate the system and like watch me. So it was kinda like actually kind of nice to see her get a bit of comeuppance um that I didn't think she would get. It was annoying that Nathaniel was like in the room and like being kind of a dick, but she did deserve it. Yeah, 100%. She was an idiot. And Archie, also a fucking idiot. But the crazy thing is she's like our protagonist and we're supposed to root for her. But honestly, I cheered <laughs> when she got fired. I was fucking elated. Like, yeah. it was uh, like the best part of this book. And obviously it works out for her at the end, but she should get fired. Yeah. Well, I, I have to argue that this was not that this was not the best part of the book and not because I'm like thinking of one particular part that's better, but because I really dislike everything that's about to happen after this happens. Oh, yeah. I didn't it's know it at the hill. time, but the like worst version of Tuesday is yet to come, I think. Yeah, I couldn't believe it. Could not believe it. I will say in the first episode of this, when Tuesday was thinking about Dex in that theater and was like, I really have a great friend here. Like, I'm so happy. I was the most naive i had ever been i remember being like i hope they just stay like this good friends yeah. and they ride it out <laughs> oh, yeah. and it just it went exactly how i thought it would which was the most yeah. cliche bullshit to ever happen because yeah tuesday fucking becomes the worst person in this book <laughs> yeah so that'll that'll get its its own focus too of tuesday being a drunken mess but one other thing we we should mention before we get into any of that is um is Dory because she kind of has a bit of a character twist around this point too because she still wants to be involved in this game even though 
her dad and at this point Tuesday don't want her to. So she, of course, is going to find her own way about it. You know, like working with Ned comes up. I think that that's something that is established before we get to the first end of the first half of the book. But then like also just the way she's interacting with people, like we get this kind of peek behind her thoughts of I need to like kind of kind of tread lightly um, when I'm having these conversations, which is the only she's the only person in this book who I think thinks that way <laughs> at any point in time. I need to tread lightly when I'm having these conversations if I'm going to get a competitive advantage because Dory, like us, thinks that she needs a competitive advantage, which turns out she doesn't really. Right, because we get scenes of her and Ned, you know, red string connecting who has what card, and they're like actually trying to solve something. And Dory is like acting like ready to manipulate to like get information from Tuesday. And like, first of all, if part of it feels like antithesis to the game in which it's supposed to be about not necessarily working with a lot of people, but I don't think you're supposed to, not that Dory's doing this, but like, it's not supposed to be like a negative experience, right? Like it's, mm -hmm. I feel like it's supposed to be something fun. Like you run around, you you find clues. Vince like wants a lot of people to participate. So the idea of like manipulating for information kind of feels off. It almost feels like Tuesday's influence, like Dory wanting to f just get as much information as possible and she doesn't care if she manipulates people for it and like she doesn't care how she gets it. And I mean, at least thankfully, Dory is working with a group. She's basically working with the Black Cats at this point. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. It feels like Tuesday's influence, but like not in a good way and not in a way yeah. that feels like in the spirit of the game. But it's also so minor because the game doesn't matter that it's <laughs> inconsequential, right? It is kind of sad to see Dory go down that path. Like I was like, I don't know if this is the right look for Dory. But on the other hand, like this is the part that I this is the type of story I thought we were going to get. <laughs> it was like kind of like factions of people like or like individuals like trying to compete and maybe even play a social game in order to get to the end and maybe that's because i made that like 39 clues reference in the first step like that's what that book's like you know that's what that series is like so i thought it was going to be a little bit more like conniving a little bit more social manipulation than it was so it's i was kind of it, it was sad to see dory go down that path but also kind of exciting to see what she would do with it which again it ended up not really mattering all that much but also, like, I do feel like Dory doesn't necessarily display a desire to do that in the long run. I think more of the story there was just her opening up socially more than anything. So, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, it was such a small blip. I think if any information had mattered, it could have been interesting for her character. Like, is it all right to do these kinds of things if it means winning like this much money and having that security and maybe seeing your mom if ghosts are real? Like, that could be an interesting dilemma, right? But yeah. it, it's that's not something that happens in this book because uh, there's three other fucking main characters to deal with. Yeah. Yes, yes. So we can go ahead forward to, to the funeral as far as the uh, puzzle solving goes because they don't really have anything else to address between then and the funeral. There's, like, a mild suggestion that Tuesday is doing some laptop research. There's That's basically it, though. There's nothing. There's nothing else to figure out. They just figure out that they're going to have to present something to Lyle and use their $13,000 before it happens. So, um, and that all gets resolved then and there. So yeah, we don't need to see any of that happening as action because we are just fed that information. We're just told. And that's kind of a big thing that happens in this book yeah, is like a lot of telling, just a lot of like matter of factness. Yeah. If you need to know a character's, you know, background or trauma, don't worry. They'll tell you uh, in the most inopportune moment. Yes. <laughs> Sometimes in a very confusing way too. Oh, absolutely. Like there's, I was, you know, I, I I mentioned this to you, but I was listening to the audiobook like I do typically, and I kind of had to just stop and switch to the actual book because it would just like flash back to some time in the past, even sometimes the recent past, without any kind of warning, because it would be like it would be talking in the present tense, and then be like, "By the way, this thing happened yesterday," and then talk about it like it was happening now. But without the part where it says, by the way, this thing happened yesterday, <laughs> it's just like a character reflecting on a thing that had just happened or a thing that had happened years ago. And so when, you, when you're when you listening to that as an audiobook, you're like, wait, how did A come to B? You know, but it, when I was able to look at it on the on the actual page and look at the text, I was like, oh, OK, like this is a new paragraph and something new is happening here. So it was just a, a weird audio formatting thing, I suppose. Yep. All right. So, yep. Let's let's go ahead and get into the funeral. <laughs> yeah. So we could talk about maybe some of these uh, 
initial interactions. Uh, you have a note here about Dory and drag share. Yeah, Dory goes to this funeral as death, which very interesting. Also feels very Tuesday, honestly. It does. You're supposed to go as like what you want to be. I think it's the idea. That was like a little unclear. I made a note where I was like, I thought the point of it was like desire, but I guess it was just imagination, which let's take a step back. Death is not the most imaginative thing you can dress up as at this point in time. It's been done. Maybe once it was, but not anymore. But it definitely wasn't because if people were dressing as Poe and people were dressing as Price himself and, you know, I guess people, right? Like existing people. I mean, maybe you can make an argument for that. You want to be like them or you want to, you could say you want to be them. That's a lot, but it didn't actually, I couldn't figure out which one it actually was kind of in the same way. I like couldn't often figure out exactly what it was that Vince wanted and like who Vince was. Um, and we could talk about that more when we get to the mansion part, but there, there was a bit of a disconnect on what exactly this was about. Yeah. I think what this ended up being was a Halloween party. It did. Honestly, it was just a way to get Halloween in the book. Absolutely. <laughs> And so Dory's is death and she notes like she's noting other care like she's noting the room, right? She's what's the word I'm thinking of? She's like uh, casing the joint uh, <laughs> in a yeah, funny yeah. way. <laughs> she notes like there's 12 tables around like again that repetition of like the 12. She's noticing other people's costumes. She notes like there's a drag share around. But OK, this is when things got <laughs> concerning, right? Yeah. Because she is, she's like, she's not sure, I guess, if it's a man or a woman. I would say it could, you know, it could be more than just those two, but we'll let it settle. And then she notes, like, they have an Adam's apple and, like, big shoulders. So now she's like, oh, it's a man dressed up as Cher. And I read that and I got, I got the ick, right? Yeah. <laughs> because, first of all, I... I get, like, looking at somebody and not knowing what their pronouns are. That makes sense. But, mm -hmm. like, you, as the author, you know what the pronouns are. Mm -hmm. You do not have to have the character figuring it out. Like, yeah, you could just say, there's a drag share over there. He looks great. You can decide that as the author. <laughs> like, having Dory sleuth it out and then also perhaps sleuth it out wrong because newsflash, Adam's apples and big shoulders do not equate a man mm -hmm. like i'm sorry to say that <laughs> and if you don't know what their pronouns are i'm going to introduce you to the most amazing concept you just use gender neutral ones yes yeah yeah or you just don't have the fucking drag share yeah i mean it's it's honestly a lot of effort put into something that doesn't matter because whether or not she figures out if this drag share is a man or not has no effect on the entire rest of the story <laughs> right it doesn't matter it just felt like it felt like a dig for no reason and i guess most people reading this book would just like glance over it and not notice but it really bothered me like yeah. as somebody who's non-binary it like really stuck out to me i could see like an argument that like the whole idea of drag is like or not the whole idea but a big idea in drag is often to make people question ideas of gender and so this is kind of having that effect on dory um and especially like it depends it's this drag is not explained enough to give it the credit for this but like a lot of times people who are playing with drag are like doing things like putting explicitly masculine features towards the forefront in an otherwise very feminine costume right like like drag queens who like let their chest hair show or like have a mustache and a beard like things like that so i think if she, if she wanted to do something like that like that that might have been if that's what she was going for, that may have been a more clear way to make that happen. Um, and I could see that potentially being what was behind this. But the way it comes off is like just as like an unnecessary questioning. Yeah. Also, because like even that is uh, like we're at the point with drag queens, like it doesn't it doesn't have to be a man dressing up like mm -hmm. what w we would understand to be a woman. Like yep. there are trans drag queens, like there are non-binary drag queens. Like it doesn't it's not as simple and yeah this is this book is taking place in 2012 but the author did not publish this in 2012 and even if it was in 2012 like that's still not a reason like it's it just bothers me so much because it's like why why have it why bring it up at all like yeah they could be trying to be like oh it's it's doing like the whole like gender blah blah blah, blah trying to speak on that like but why 
why is this yeah. author trying to speak <laughs> on it like yeah. do they even have the authority to speak on it and at this late in the game with this one sentence i don't fucking think so mm. but yeah this is a long discussion for this one line but <laughs> it really got to me to be honest for sure no I, I i think it's it's worth the conversation it's not the only time i think we're gonna have questions about the way sexuality and gender are presented in this book so yeah talking about this stuff do you want to just do the decks and uh, just decks just flat yeah. out just, just flat out decks <laughs> Yes, because Dex is presented in a very particular way in this chapter that I kind of found upsetting myself. So we can definitely get into that. Um, I guess there's a few descriptions of him that mostly in this chapter that I think stereotype him, right? And I think he even like says that that's what's happening, but I don't feel like it makes it okay. Like his whole thing being like, I'm begging for attention and like, why else would I be doing drag madonna if i wasn't like begging for attention so that was like kind of icky another one was like him urging it was described something along the lines of like having an urge to dress as madonna like gay clockwork which that was probably that was actually like the most i think obvious upsetting line in the whole thing like i maybe if maybe if this book was written by a gay man i would have been like haha ha, fine you know <laughs> but the uh, the fact is that it wasn't <laughs> and so it really bothered me to see like this characterization of the one really main gay character in the book because Bert is kind of another thing to be like to be so stereotypical like there wasn't and it's not like Dex had a whole lot of complexity behind him his entire character is is developed in perspective of relationship issues so having to do with like other people <laughs> and like a poor self a poor relationship with himself so like it it doesn't really give you that like the detail the grounding the background to understand dex fully than to be making comments about like how all of the issues he's confronting with are just like issues with being stereotypically gay right like i remember we were slightly worried about this in the beginning of the book because he read so much like the typical gay best friend Mm mm-hmm I don't know why all the gay characters in this book are so weird. <laughs> Honestly. They're either drag queens because Dex feels like more, not like, not more like himself, but like he feels, I guess, kind of more like himself when he Just puts like on drag. Yeah. Like when he puts on drag makeup, he, he tells us in this weird flashback moment that those are like good moments for him. Like it feels like he's more like himself than the other part he's playing. Something to that effect. Mm-hmm. And then we have like this drag share that is randomly thrown in for no reason. And then we have Bert with his whole rabbit shit. Like, I just, I'm like, what? Why is nobody normal in this book? Like, <laughs> why the, why, like, what happened to just like, a, this is going to sound so weird, but like, gay people can just be normal. Yeah. I honestly, I just think that this, this portrayal of gay characters in the perspective of some people is exceedingly normal. Like, I think this is just, this is just reflective of the perception people have about gay people, which is usually just for a specific kind of gay person. So there, I I can very much see this being like the author being like, I'm going to have a gay character and this is what gay characters look like. And this is what gay representation looks like. And maybe to some degree, she's not wrong. Like this is some gay people are going through this stuff. A lot of them are going through like feelings of of lack of self-confidence and relationship issues and like a lot of gay folks feel comfortable in drag but this is not by first of all not a universal experience and i would accept it more if it were more complicated it's just the fact that it really seems to hit like center average on all of the stereotype portrayals you would get of a gay man in media it's not doing anything new exciting unique um or deep right yeah i agree 100 percent I think part of what the, the this author's problem is, it's like she tried to do too much with everything, sure. like with the plot, with the characters, and she doesn't have enough time to do any of it. And so we get told this information in like random moments instead of being shown and like given time to experience with any of these characters. So yeah, everything just feels flat and like also unnecessary. Yeah. She also does a wild fucking thing. <laughs> <laughs> which i missed <laughs> and it's yeah. actually kind of crazy like i it part of it makes sense because like in a film or like in the audiobook i guess you would need to say it mm-hmm. but 
same with like Dory's comment about the share. Like it feels unnecessary of a line. Yeah. Well, that at that part, I was actually listening to the audiobook again because I went back for the last maybe two, three chapters, wherever it happens. Uh, so I got to hear it and that was jarring uh, because they had to read it. So yeah, so when um, it's, this is like way t- later. So we are going to get a bit ahead of ourselves to talk about this, but it's it's just because the conversation we're having, like during this like karaoke kind of section happening during the final moments of the puzzle, Dex has kind of this, I don't know if, I guess like a flashback or at least like an image of his, I think it was his dad, like calling him a slur. Um a like, homophobic slur and saying like you know this is not how you make a living and like obviously like we're trying i think the idea is to get a peek back into why dex is it didn't end up becoming the theater kid he wanted to be you know and like since i mentioned how dex doesn't really get the complexity he needs to be getting into all of this stereotypical and seemingly superficial stuff um that he's been written into dropping the f-bomb seems awfully bold um it it comes out of left field it doesn't get it doesn't lead up to that we don't hear anything else and we're three chapters away from the end of the book Um, so it didn't it felt like poor use and yeah just awfully awfully bold yeah i also feel like gay man has parental issues wow tell me something new like (laughs) exactly and that's it's just another thing on the list of stereotypical things it's again it's not like you can write me a gay character with any of these things any one two or three of them but they need something else they need more character than that right because like what is the resolution like he finds a guy that seems to like him he sings karaoke for an hour in a decrepit house and he seems to have like the revelation that he is good like that the job he was doing was shit and that like he should do something else like Mm -hmm. yes that is an understandable character arc but also does it feel earned in any way? Does it, or does it feel deep enough? I guess exactly. It's like nice to see that, right? But it doesn't feel super powerful. Yeah, and I think that karaoke moment was supposed to feel powerful. But even in that karaoke moment, we're like told this Madonna song has been on my mind. It's haunted me for years and yeah. years. And I'm like, has it? It's the first time I've ever heard of it. Like <laughs> that was also really upsetting to read. For it's like this really dramatic like i am talking about like this super important deep powerful thing and it's like oh yeah it's it's more madonna actually (laughs) like we have in fact still not added any more complexity to this man and it, it was a wild thing to include both from a plot perspective like they really sang karaoke for a fucking hour with a murderer right next to them crazy shit and the fact that it's supposed to be such an important moment for dex but literally, like, we get hints that he likes karaoke and shit like that in the beginning of the book. Mm-hmm. But there's a difference between liking karaoke and, like, being haunted by a song in which you have to sing it to feel like yourself. Like, there's different vibes going on. I, I was also just confused in that part of the book in general, so <laughs> it didn't help. Uh, let's let's maybe bring it back to the funeral we'll bring before it back. we get too far into that. There's a... One more Dex adjacent thing I'll mention, but this is less on Dex's character and actually <laughs> on Bert. Um, so like Bert, or sorry, Dex has like done his his little dance around the party trying to figure out where Bert is. And uh, when Bert sees him, he doesn't say anything. And like Dex goes through this whole mental gymnastics of like, oh man, like I'm doing too much. I'm seeking attention. All these things we've been talking about. And Bert just, I mean, Dex says, I think four different statements with presumed pauses in between before Bert says you're astonishing at which is not an inherently positive statement <laughs> and, and so then Dex is like I don't know if I really believe him and I'm like yeah me neither like Bert what like I thought this was just weird behavior for <laughs> I don't know I feel like Bert didn't like it honestly it was just weird it was just odd I didn't like this interaction at all yeah I mean to be honest like I I could get into all the relationships in this book, but the idea that Bert and Dex, I don't know, there's something about them that just isn't right. Yeah. (laughs) And that might be the most homophobic statement I've ever said in my life. (laughs) I, to me, it's the thing that's not right here is Bert, honestly, (laughs) like there's, and, and speaking of undeveloped characters, like Bert, there's nothing. I don't even, I don't know anything about him. I feel like after all this. The only thing we know is that he's fucking cringe as hell, like I said. 
<laughs> all we know is that everyone calls him rabbit all of a sudden for no good reason. For no reason. Like, even Tuesday does that shit. I'm like, Tuesday, get up. Like, get it together. It's just, yeah, I don't get him. And I mean, I guess respect other people's names. If they, you know, have a name they prefer, you should yeah, say that name. Sure. <laughs> we should say that. Why did we but... even start with the Bert then, you know? Oh, my God. It, yeah. And it's like, does he just like being called rabbit like or is it like i thought it was going to be this weird alice in wonderland thing yeah and it was going to play into the puzzle aspect but no the guy just likes being called rabbit it's it's so weird and it's like a weird thing that that feels extra weird because he's gay like i don't know how to explain it like there's just something about it that feels off yeah i think we're with Dex kind of conditioned to look at Bert with a bit of a side eye because we already are like feeling kind of weird about Dex and the way he's being portrayed. So yeah, yeah. I think we're just a, a, being who we are, right? <laughs> like we are especially conscious to this aspect, even if it was meant to be minor, right? I think the author was at first attempting like a casual gay main character, and in treating that main character as a bit of a stereotype, it raised our flags a little bit, and we paid extra attention to it. Yeah, yeah. Because, like, in a time of representation, quote-unquote, like, I'm still of the opinion, if it is bad representation, then I'm still going to fucking complain. Yeah. I don't know. That's just my opinion. And this feels... Something's off. I don't know. I don't know how to explain it, you know? And maybe it was unintentional. Like, I don't want to talk shit on the author. I don't know the author. (laughs) But there's a couple of things going on that just aren't sitting. Mm -hmm. But enough gay shit. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so let's we'll start progressing towards the end of the the funeral and we can mention how tuesday basically just doesn't engage now nah, she doesn't give a shit at this fun point of this funeral <laughs> yeah she just shows up which i guess could be notable in the if you're dressing is what you want to be she just is herself but also what a terrible thing to be you know boring yeah and <laughs> lila who i don't want to call lyle because it feels wrong like it should to everyone else in the story but anyway it calls them out on their lack of costumes both her and archie <laughs> who's just wearing vince's robe which i feel like is kind of creepy personally <laughs> it is weird like i'm still it's something about that relationship is weird too <laughs> yes, like obviously we we get the backstory of like vince and constance and all of that which i haven't thought about but yeah there's something yeah it's weird maybe it was just like a a paternal type of like he feels comforted by vince but <laughs> it was giving daddy issues for sure yes yeah <laughs> so so they get into the, the interview with uh with lila and both uh tuesday and, and archie go in together and she lets archie know that he's just in and it doesn't matter that he looks like crap and didn't engage for a while because he's just got a free pass in but tuesday still has to prove herself And the way that Tuesday has proven herself is taking the $13,000, finding effectively a rando from New York (laughs) on the internet uh, who's lost someone and given them money to, I forget, honestly, like start some sort of foundation or something like that. I forget the details. But the reason I bring this up was that uh, one of my biggest qualms with this quote puzzle or game is that there's a super subjective moment happening here where lila just gets to decide who's in and who isn't based on actions that she didn't design i mean maybe but she mentions before that vince was pretty secretive about stuff so it's unclear how she even learns what her role is in this you know and so it seemed to even uh, even further devalue the puzzle steps that have occurred up until this point to know that they just had to kind of guess what the right next move was and see if lila liked it and if lila thought it was something vince liked which is not something she would be able to do perfectly but i guess she's the best chance they have Um, so i just i guess i bring this up all to say that i don't like this i don't like this feature of the game if it did feel like it, it was the most direct uh strike against the sort of puzzle i was expecting which was one with a solution Right. It also felt a lot like plot armor, right? Because, I mean, some of the choices were easy. They tried to buy their way in. Fuck you. Get out of here. Right. right? But, like, characters like Dory, in my opinion, like, her and Ned, I think they just, what, saved the money? Like, that's their solution? Right. They, like, saved it for college. (laughs) Right. Which makes sense, but it's not imaginative. It's not creative. Uh, And also, Dory lies in her interview. And... (laughs) lyle seems to know that Mm -hmm. 
And maybe that's interesting enough to Lyle that she lets Dory in. But it also felt like it felt like not enough. Like, I don't know why Ned and Dory got in, to be honest. No, it was just like this whole process was really fake, too, honestly. Like, even this part of the game wasn't really what it claimed to be. And like, none of these people actually got in because the thing they did was imaginative, right? Like, no, no one was imaginative here. And that's what they said the criteria was, was some level of creativity. And to me, saving money for yourself and spending all the money on someone else's cause are both not imaginative. Just donating money is not imaginative. Good for you, right? Do it. Mm -hmm. More people probably should, but that's not the point of Vince's story. He wants to not have money at the end of his life. He wishes he didn't have money and he wished people would give more, but he wanted whimsy, right? Like the way he's described is like he wanted something interesting and that's not what happens here. This is what gets me really confused about Vince's portrayal because part of him is like, it, it is giving whimsical and then the other part of it is giving a cult, which is a much smaller part, but I guess a part we're supposed to take literally. And then there's also the part where he's also still just another rich dude. So none of it really makes sense to me here. The real thing that seems to be happening here is kind of what I think Dory says, or maybe it was Tuesday towards the end of the story of like, was this all just an interview for a job? And I think the answer is just kind of yes. Like yeah. Lila talks about casting people into certain roles when they're there, they they're figuring out questionably why they're there. Of like, oh, I'm here because I know this and I know that. And it's like, cool. Well, then the interview was just a way to get people in the room so that way she could find people who knew certain things, right? Like, it wasn't actually about the money part. It was, Like, the part, the, the skills that they needed in order to fulfill Lila's roles were established before the puzzle game was over. We mentioned in the first part, it felt like Bert and Lyle were championing Dex and Tuesday in this puzzle. Yeah, and they already know who they need. Yeah, and and, like... At what, like, at that point, the puzzle's over. Like, even <laughs> at that point, the puzzle was over. Yeah. I can see, like, some, I can give it some credit for being, like, just a way to, like, get people in the zone that they need to be in to fill those roles by making them do that puzzle portion at the beginning, right? Like, it kind of brought out a certain thing in Dory and Ned and, like, the other black cats to have to do that puzzle. And so when they come up to Lila, they can be like, here's, like, the things I did. And that shows Lila, oh, cool, like, you're this kind of puzzle solver. I want you. Which, again, does just amount it all to a job interview. But at least it gives the puzzle portion a little bit more importance. It's weird that it doesn't end a little closer to the funeral itself, because to me, like, a puzzle solver would keep solving until they hit a solution. <laughs> but, but at least it gives some reason for, for putting them through all of that. The thing I don't like is that it's, yeah, like, here's all these characters we've really never met before, like, all coming together in this one moment. Like, we were introduced to characters who end up having dialogue in the house in the chapter before, right? So it doesn't it doesn't pay off super well to have all of these characters build up their skills or behave a certain way when, like, we vaguely hear about them secondhand through a Facebook page. Right. And also because none of that, like, matters in the actual puzzle aspect. Yeah. Like, the only important pieces in the Tillerman house for the actual Vince puzzle is Dory with the goggles because she can see the symbols and Dex because of the karaoke, which I still don't understand how that works. Like, were, was it like intentionally built so shit would fall off the walls or was that an accident? Like, <laughs> I'm not sure when the planning started and stopped in that yeah. scenario. So like, that's what I mean by messy. But like everybody else, sure, they they were there for the job interview, for what happened to the Tillerman house after the puzzle. Mm -hmm. But for the puzzle itself, like, they did not need to be in that house at all. Like, yep, I agree. None of that mattered. Nope, it's the, the results of this all is the most boring part, which is the job after, for sure. The reason they're in that house, and this might be skipping a bit, is so that they can be put in fucking grave danger <laughs> so they can try and catch a criminal. <laughs> That's why they're in the, the Tillerman house. And crazy to send some 14-year-olds in there. Oh, my God. Well, we'll come back to the, the full story of what happens at the Tillerman house a bit later on. I think maybe we should close out our puzzle discussion otherwise. I just, I like, I guess I have some final thoughts here. Just that, like, I did feel like the puzzle started out in a good place and then just really fell flat, <laughs> you know. And I mentioned it a little bit earlier. I kind of do wish that there was more distrust in this story. Dory, like, is the only character who does that. 
Tuesday claims that she doesn't trust people and then trusts them. So that doesn't give it to us at all. I just don't feel like this game was actually a competition and that's how it was framed. And so for that, the puzzle just wasn't for me. Yeah, I mean, the marketing of this book is a lie. We're supposed to be going through like a romp on the city, like finding clues, right. solving puzzles. Uh, characters are supposed to get together, like face their pasts and all of this crazy shit. And it's centered around the puzzle or, or around the treasure hunt, right? But who cares? We have Poe introductions that are just pointless and dropped. Yeah, that actually really didn't amount to anything, huh? It didn't matter. It was spooky, I guess. Yeah. But yeah, it it was not an epic treasure hunt. In fact, I would say it was hardly even a treasure hunt. Because what really mattered in this book, if we could move on, <laughs> yes, is the hunt inside the hunt, which was the true crime element of this book. Because this book unintentionally had a lot going on. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, too much, some would say. But uh, as we suspected, uh, Nate killed his fucking father, and yeah. we need to deal with that scenario. Oh, goodness. Oh, I hated this. Um, yeah, so we, we kind of get the behind the scenes. I guess, yeah, the Archie uh, POV of what happens on the day the father dies. I feel like in the, the way that it was talked about, they all they know is that Nate, Nath, 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 Nathaniel <laughs> and his father um, were on a boat together, correct? Mm -hmm. Is that, and that's the location. And no one seems to mention that Edgar exists, like younger Edgar, Archie. I mean, do you mean in the media or the fact that he was on the boat? Just the fact that he was on the boat, right? Like everyone talks about them too, but not him. Well, I think it's because nobody knew. Like he had... Okay. He had gotten upset about something and then he like went to the boat by himself, was sleeping on the floor or something like that. And so like nobody knew he was there. And he, gotcha. yeah, he heard basically Nate kill his father. It's just, it would be weird to me to think that like they would come back to shore and Nathaniel would be like, oh my God, my father is missing and just act like Archie wasn't there at all. Like I'm shocked he wouldn't pull him in on that. Maybe, but also I think it's because... They ended up deciding Archie would just disappear from the family. Right. So if like Archie was on the boat and then he disappeared, it would be even weirder, I think. Mm -hmm. And just like they weren't high profile enough for other people to realize that this son had gone missing too. Like that just doesn't line up for me. That is, yeah. I mean, we complained in the first book about this weird twin situation in which they're <laughs> like a decade apart in age, but whatever. And Archie just does not exist, like, anywhere for some reason. It was just so bizarre. Yeah. But I, I have to say on this whole situation that I've just decided everyone is everyone who is involved is a terrible person. <laughs> like, so obviously just the reason why this even started to happen to begin with was because the father was a terrible person. So that's, that's not even in the question. Then Nat is terrible for doing the murder. Nat's mom and Vince are terrible for coordinating the behind the scenes part of the murder where they're supposed to catch Nat, Nat, oh, catch Nat doing the murder, but not do anything else about it. And then also covering it up when it doesn't go the way they want it to. And then Archie's terrible for just doing the thing, like helping cover up the murder and then not saying anything about it afterwards. <laughs> and like just letting it happen. Like, I just feel like every everyone is bad here yeah for sure like this is rich people bullshit 100 yes and also like i understand being well i don't understand i've never experienced it but being in like a loveless <laughs> abusive relationship and then like basically cheating and being with somebody else whatever like it makes sense right but the fact that vince had something with constance and continued to love her forever but then also <laughs> married lyle yes and also got lyle pregnant oh god something about it just is not right <laughs> in my head yeah i hate it all <laughs> it's, and it's like weird too because you hear about the earlier parts of the story where vince is like bringing over cookies and stuff like that's it it's weird now right it's like oh you were you were going for this from the start it's also crazy because when i was first reading those moments i was like please platonic friendship yeah actually i was vaguely convinced that's what it was yeah and but then it's a, it's a, a 
man and a woman being friends they have to be in love with each other yep. there's no other option clearly. well not only that but we should get into the relationship with archie a little bit here honestly because vince is like like basically the way i've interpreted this relationship is like archie hated his dad vince came in and was like definitely like being suspicious but like definitely loving up on his mom and he was like well i guess i like my new dad better basically yeah <laughs> it's like whoa this is like i i don't it's hard to believe <laughs> i i understand i would think that it'd feel a lot more complicated than that but but the way we see him talk about vince after all this is like i you know vince was like so important to me and like i loved him and like yada yada <laughs> like it just all started from such a weird place i don't know how you could speak so plainly about it that whole family's fucked like something about it just ain't right because right. even emerson like you didn't include her but even emerson she was the blackmailer right in this book she was helping vince to torture nat yeah which somehow got pinned on archie <laughs> yeah. and just made nat even angrier at archie so i feel like that had the opposite effect of right. what we wanted oh my gosh. it was just so fucking messy yeah because playing games instead of just doing the simple things like there's i i don't know you could have probably taken your choice but i mean right from the beginning they i think archie could have just gone to the police and been like this horrible thing happened and like this is like i did this because i was fearful for my life you know like something <laughs> but that was mistake number one and then they just let it cascade into a shit ton more mistakes because they thought like like because they feel powerful enough to just be like they can handle it themselves and do what they feel is best in their own best interest to handle the situation. And then they screw each other over even more. Right, because we've reached this point where you have to use your own death to fake a game so that you can draw out a murderer and put innocent people in danger. Yeah. I mean, just about giving him another murder victim to do so. Like, oh, yeah, what better way to prove that he's a murderer than watching him murder someone else? Oh my god, when we got to the end of the book, we're jumping again. But in the Tillerman house, when <laughs> Nat is there, and that woman, like, Tuesday sees her on the floor, I thought she was fucking dead. Yeah, dude, absolutely. It's like, oh, he did kill someone in, in, in order to get caught murdering. Well, no, 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 she didn't end up actually dead. Right, no, that's what I, this is the thoughts I was having, too, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, because she's just, like, unconscious on the floor. Thankfully, she's alive, but, like, also crazy that she's alive. I'm surprised Honestly, she wasn't fucking dead. I bet dead. That his intention was to kill her. Right. And it's like, yeah, you just put 13 innocent people, two of them being kids and a couple of them being like college age or whatever, like in actual danger. Crazy, crazy rich people bullshit, to be honest. Like, holy shit. But yeah, that's the true crime element. Yes. Um, all right. So yes, we talked about exactly what happened that day. Tuesday, um, <laughs> Tuesday does this thing. She has this whole binder about the arches and shows it to uh, Archie. And he's like, wow, there's so much information in here, which I'm like, I, I don't know if there would be anything in there that he didn't already know, but he seems to imply that that's the case. Um, and that just gives it to him, right? Yes. Yeah. She shows up to one of Price's places that Archie's staying at. Uh, she's completely stalked his entire family yes. and put it in a neat little binder and they like have dinner they're still, I guess, going to solve this thing together. Crazy. Sure. And yeah, she does leave it for him. And she's like, you know, look through this. Look through all of this crazy information I found about your family. It just seems like she's trying to flex, honestly. <laughs> yes, 100%. She, she's doing that Tuesday thing again where she's like, I know everything and I can read everyone. And like, nah, I know all the details because I'm superior. Because <laughs> even in the conversation she's having with him, she's like, this is what happened and this is why you don't get along with your brother like she's trying to do the sherlock holmes thing where she's figuring things out and connecting the dots and it's like it feels like pointless showing off mm -hmm. because she's not actually like solving anything because she is being led to the answers anyway right like mm -hmm. right there's nothing else to solve at this point really yeah what is happening here is and I feel like either I mentioned it in the f this first episode or in a different book we read, like the, the cozy mystery experience, some of the time, uh, where the protagonist kind of just gets dragged to the answers. They don't actually work to solve anything. Yep. Because even in the puzzle aspect, Tuesday hardly solves anything, right? Dory gives her the first clue, which leads to the tunnel. Dex leads her to the underground theater. 
which gives them the packet. The packet doesn't mean anything, so she doesn't have anything to solve. For the true crime, she already knows Nat and Edgar disappeared on the boat together. Any idiot could put that together, to be honest. <laughs> and then she's basically like, is, is she told or she maybe she does figure out like Archie was there or something. I don't know the extent of that because yeah. we're getting so many POVs. I don't know who knows what anymore, you know? Mm -hmm. Because that was the part, and that's the part that I was going to complain about, because that's the part between, like, Emerson and her, right? Like, going through the story, and at a certain point, Tuesday picks up the storytelling. Right, yeah, because it's like, oh, the mother doesn't want to do this. When they're in the hospital, like, she's mm -hmm. laying out what happened in the past. But Tuesday's even led to the Tillerman house, which has the image of Constance. So now Tuesday is basically being given the information about Vince and Constance. And we have Edgar's clock and a well. And it's like, okay, if Edgar's clock is here, which he carried with him all the time, and a deep-ass well is here, <laughs> I mean, what do you think happened? Right. I mean, I guess she knows be through research that Nat once owned the house. That's important information. Did she find that out or Dory? I think she did. I think because of Dory's report, we know Vince owns the house. Gotcha. Okay. But yeah, it going from being an Arches house to an N.A. house, which would be Nat, to then a Vince house, I think is what Tuesday figures out. So she doesn't find out nothing, but when it comes down to the, actually the major turning points of the story, she just happens to be the person connected in all of them, not the person finding them out. Right. And I feel like even if like you didn't know Nat owned the house, I, th I feel like you would still have enough clues to put together what happened. If you have Constance and Edgar in the house in some capacity... You could you could figure out what Vince is putting down here, mm -hmm. but maybe I'm being too harsh. Well, I have some thoughts about this too. I think in some ways, like it, we we can give her credit for at least having the drive to be the person connected to all of these things, you know, to be able to like have one person who knows all of the stuff, even if it's really just knowing it and not figuring it out always. I did like the interaction with Emerson, I just didn't like that she picked up the storytelling because I didn't think she deserved it. I didn't think she deserved to be like, I do know everything. Like, look at me being like the best, you know? That's like that part of Tuesday that I don't like. But like, if we look back into the story, like, there's not a good reason to believe that she actually is that way. And particularly, the there's some things that she, she doesn't know that she's like feels... <laughs> so if she doesn't actually know how how Archie feels when she meets him like way at the beginning of the book she's like I can read everyone like I know everyone's tells like I can tell right from the start that like this soul is like really like missing missing someone and she assumes that it's his dad right like she's like I know this guy in and out because he's really missing his dad and like I'm really missing someone I lost and like it takes her way long I don't even know if she ever says it in her own words to figure out that it's Vince that made him feel that way to begin with and she figures out that he's missing Vince early enough but i don't think she actually makes the connection that he doesn't miss his dad for quite a while and that he was present when his dad went missing like that takes basically i mean that does get confirmed with her at the end of the book i think but she doesn't really know nearly as much about archie as she thinks she does and yet she spends the whole book masquerading how she's able to figure out everything about everyone via her amazing research skills that she picked up at her job she got fired from so it just it is she actually isn't who she claims to be and so therefore i didn't like that she got that kind of final say by finishing emerson's story yeah i also think she's given moments where it doesn't make sense that she knows the answer like when she is after she gets fired when she gets drunk and dex is basically taking care of her and bert shows up and she obviously knows he's probably more involved but her figuring out he's the banker, that to me did not make sense. Mm. I mean, as the the reader, it can make sense because Burr obviously is a character that should matter. Like, why is he in this book? He must serve a purpose. Like, from a narrative perspective, it makes sense for us to think that. But if you're in the city of Boston, you don't know how many people Vince has working for him. Like, you cannot judge who is important to him just because you've met them. I was actually not convinced when that happened that he was the only one. Yeah, it just feels like such a leap to make in universe because, yeah, you've met Bert, but that doesn't mean you've met everybody Vince has talked to about this. Like, it was such a leap, but it 
paid off for her because she's the fucking main character well yeah there's there's a lot of like matter of factness when tuesday says some things where you have to be like oh this is just the author telling me that this thing is the truth not tuesday figuring something out so like like in the basement theater thing when she's like oh like like at the end of that one chapter she's like oh like archie loved vince and you just kind of have to take it because you're, you have no other evidence except tuesday's word that that's what's happening here you're just like tuesday's like i just i saw the look on his face and he loved him and like that's all you have so so you have to take it as as fact even though it's not earned yeah it just it, it to me yeah it feels like tuesday is flawed and we're not accepting it it'd be one thing if we were accepting it but that's not what's happened. The story is not accepting that Tuesday is flawed. Yeah. Because, yeah, she doesn't get reprimanded in any way, does she? Like, she gets a job where she basically will be doing the same thing. Exactly, yeah. And she keeps all of her friends and, like, she gets a probably boyfriend and it's like, okay, so what what happened? <laughs> like, <laughs> what did she learn? I mean, I guess she says some shit that she thinks she's learned, but that doesn't feel like a payoff either. But end of book conversation i suppose yeah <laughs> so anyway shocker we went on a bit of a tangent into that but we were talking about we got here from talking about the binder so tuesday brings the binder of all this information and then archie decides to go say with emerson mm -hmm. i guess i couldn't understand if this was like a family home or specifically emerson's i think it was I was also confused because I feel like he mentioned going to see Emerson at her home, but I think he does end up going to their family home. Right, because then he's like, oh, like Nathaniel's here, which doesn't feel like he would just casually be at Emerson's house. Like, I, I doubt he has like a key, you know? <laughs> yeah, it felt like such a dumb fucking move. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. He was, he, up until this point, he's been hiding off at Vince's house. Why would he suddenly change that? Yeah, his thought process was like, I need help with this. Like, I should talk to Emerson because she's, like, the most smart, no-nonsense person I know. Like, and I'm, like, sure that makes sense, I suppose. He seems to trust Emerson a lot. But it's, it's like, you have to show up to the family home where Nat might be? And you also bring the binder? Oh, my God. Yeah, that's so stupid. And not even for a good reason. Like, you bring it so you can laugh about it. Like, you should get your ass beat. Like, what are you thinking? <laughs> emerson emerson's not even there at all right she i think shows up after and like helps him out patches him up because no one goes to a hospital or an urgent care in this story and emerson is conveniently a live-in nurse somehow yeah, well she has a lot of experience yeah uh so he has been sleeping there for a few days which is why when tuesday gets fired he's like not able to contact her and like vice versa because his phone is also i think broken right yeah they busted his phone yeah Archie does find the postcards in Emerson's room, though, which I thought was interesting. Oh, I kind of forgot about that. <laughs> yeah, it was a small scene. It felt very forced because, like, why either her drawer was open or he looked through it. And I honestly can't think of the reason why. But, yeah, it was, like, a postcard and it had, like, the I will ruin you, whatever yeah. the saying was. And I thought, at first I thought, like, Emerson was just keeping the postcards the family was being sent. But then I was like, obviously, Archie's not the one sending them then. If he's confused as to what they are. I, I didn't think Emerson was involved in them, though. But that's, like, our first hint that that's yeah. happening. It was such a weird scene and, like, it almost felt like it didn't happen that it didn't, like, actually occur to me until just now that that was the foreshadowing on that. It was kind of pointless, to be honest. Like, first of all, why would she store them in her room? <laughs> right. It's like the binder all over again. Especially like, if Archie's just around. It? Or not Archie, if Nat is just around. Right. But, Yeah. Uh, we have a brief moment of miscommunication because Tuesday thinks she's gotten betrayed by Archie. Archie is uh, fucked up and can't contact her. And I thought this would ride a little bit longer. But no, it's resolved pretty quickly. Uh, Archie shows up at Tuesdays. They're both miserable. So obviously, as any person would do, <laughs> they sleep together. <laughs> oh my god. I was like, uh -huh. so deeply confused by this scene because of all the times in the story where like the casual sex could have happened this one just didn't make a lot of sense to me because archie's like literally broken and <laughs> like not to get too into the weeds of it all but i just can't imagine how much of a pleasurable sexual experience that could have been for someone who was so beat up he even mentions like it kind of hurts to be touched and i'm like so what do you think is happening in the bedroom here <laughs> like, 
Yeah. Yeah, it was yeah, I have no I have no word. I knew <laughs> just, it would happen. Yeah. The timing was just weird to me. I don't know. I guess there probably wouldn't have been a better time, honestly, in the scene of event, the events that happened in this book, but just from the physical aspect it made little sense to me. Also, didn't Tuesday like faint moments before this? Oh yeah. yeah not, oh yeah, not to only not only was Archie fully like injured but tuesday was yeah she also fainted in the hallway when she saw him so it just seems like neither of them were in a state to be doing this yeah <laughs> absolutely that's just dumb that's all it was just dumb <laughs> and there was no good build up to it or anything either like there was no like tweet no. talk or anything it's just oh we haven't seen each other for three days and we haven't fucked yet so i guess now we'll do it yeah i mean they were both just fucking sad as hell yeah and i guess that makes sense but obviously i'm going to hate it mm. <laughs> and i did hate it and i hated when they continued to do so for the rest of this book but after the fact tuesday obviously will snoop through archie's things as she is wont to do with no tact at all absolutely not she finds the letter from price and it was like typed on a typewriter or something and she noted they were missing letters that must have been like mistakes in the typing. And I looked at that and I said, ain't no way. Yeah, of course. No shot. Vince, who is so far basically planned this puzzle to like a T, would mistake some letters. Yeah, of course. So, you know, you find the missing letters, you put together the message. Tell your mother I love her. The mother obviously being Constance, but not that this message matters because it does not come up does not seem to be solved by anybody yeah. in this book <laughs> and amounts to nothing because Constance also does not return to this book. I didn't even think about I mean when it ha when I read this and I I also like did the little the little calculation of what the message was. I was certain it would come up. I was like, you know, it probably doesn't even matter that I like it, that I did this because someone's just going to tell me later in the book that that's what this was and then I'm going to go back and be like, "Oh my god, there was a message there," right? Like if I if I hadn't <laughs> done it and yeah, mm -hmm. it does never it never happens. No, it's it's fun. I had a little bit of fun, mm -hmm. but I mean, it confirms confirms Archie confirmed. But it, it I guess lets us know that even at the end of his life, Vince was in love with Constance. But that made me fucking hate Vince. Yeah, because what what about fucking Lyle? Lyle, who is pregnant for no fucking reason. I don't mind get it. I you. Think it's just I'm like... still pissed about that. <laughs> Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. No, no, no. That's all. I'm just pissed. Okay. <laughs> it almost feels like then like Lila's character only really exists to be someone who is not a part of the main family who can do the running of the game. Yes. Like otherwise I think her character need not exist. This all could have been written under Constance, but we didn't want it to be in Arches, so. Yeah. Lyle is simply a poor woman who I think was also a person of color, who married an old white man who was in love with somebody else and now has to enact his will for the rest of her life. But don't worry, she seems to be happy about it. <laughs> and she seems, even though she hated marriage before this, she seems to be content with being a widow, uh, putting on a show, and now falling pregnant at like 40, which can be quite dangerous but mm -hmm. okay and she seems to be enthused for motherhood as all women should be <laughs> oh no <laughs> sorry, you can probably hear from my tone <laughs> <laughs> that i'm getting more and more upset <laughs> as we talk about this book what would you like to talk about john oh <laughs> well i'll just comment on that briefly and it was kind of silly the whole like this is another thing that Tuesday figures out like, oh, look, she's not drinking that like kind of doesn't amount to much other than a later confirmation that she's pregnant, but no like storyline benefits. So I agree. That's yeah, very odd. Um, all right. I guess the last section of things we should talk about is I mean, we've really been talking about it already, so it's unfair to act like this is a discreet section of our discussion, but just some of the relationships throughout the book um, and some of the sort of unhinged behavior that they contain <laughs> so one part of the book we we alluded to and didn't get deeply into was just like this portion of the book the part that i referred to as being my least favorite where tuesday had just been fired and just kind of gets shit-faced 
and for a long time seemingly and is just kind of a piece of shit to the people around her in the process even though like she did this to herself (laughs) which i guess is part of the problem that she did it to herself and she knows that so i guess i would want to start talking about like her interaction with dex and how she like literally just puts him on blast in front of bert yeah tuesday yeah airs out shit she should not be speaking on and i think she also does it i mean one because she's drunk as hell but also because she's jealous as hell like she makes a note that she's upset that dex has seemed to find this person that finally accepts him like she cannot fathom it even though we've been told she's completely fine being single single there's no reason she would be upset she likes being signal Mm. like signal single all of these things and yeah she's upset about that and like she's upset about her job she's upset about dex seeming to find love like She's kind of feeling left out, I think, in this scene. She's got this underlying thing here, though, where she clearly doesn't think Dex deserves a relationship. Like, she thinks he's broken. He already thinks he's broken. But now she's just airing out that he. she also thinks that he is broken and doesn't deserve a good person, you know? Yeah, and does what she say ring kind of true? Maybe. But also, it's none of her fucking business. Yeah. Like, she could bring these up with Dex later as, like, a good friend. But the issue with this is Tuesday has never been a good friend in her entire fucking life. Like, (laughs) her and Dex are not friends. Mm -hmm. We thought maybe at the underground theater, Tuesday would be better and, like, actually reach out and do what friends are supposed to do. But no, we got the cliche scene where their relationship breaks down again. But the issue with having this scene is they were never friends to begin with. For 10 years, Dex was the one reaching out. He was the one maintaining their relationship. Tuesday was doing nothing. And Tuesday thought he was a bother. Even in the beginning of this book, she calls him clingy and like basically annoying. And we're supposed to believe they're best friends by the end of this book? Fuck you. Like absolutely fucking not. And I'm jumping again, but getting back to this drunk scene, we'll try and rein it in. I'll rein it in, I promise. (laughs) She like puts him on blast like that and then also does the one thing he asked her not to do which was talk about this puzzle or like be pushy about getting information dex is like oh my gosh this is just this is just a hangout like please be chill don't dig for information this is not an interrogation i'm trying to be here for you because you're going through it just be normal be normal he's asking nothing from her and she reads him for no reason and then also interrogates Bert and it's also for no reason like the puzzle at this point of the book doesn't matter like there's you don't need to know Bert is the banker it doesn't matter and you're being so like you're yes you're hurt you think Archie betrayed you like you got fired but there is a line it should be making her problem other people's problems right yes and in my head if I was Dex I would be done I would be so fucking done. I would not reach the end of this book and consider her my best friend. Yeah. I think if Dex had more friends, maybe that would be the case, you know? I think he has such a low self-image that he doesn't probably feel like he gets a choice there. But the matter of the fact is that he is, like, Tuesday does not deserve Dex, who has been putting in so much of that effort. Like, it is, it's a one-way friendship. And yeah, like, there's just, there's no reason... There's no reason at this point to be friends with Tuesday. She's just causing him more trouble than it's worth. If she if she is supposed to be his supporter and she can't even support him in this one thing, you know, it just it doesn't make any sense. So I agree with everything you're saying. This just made me miserable, to be honest. And it's like, yeah, it's like I and I do, you know, I, I know I've been critical of Dex's character, but like I do. I did like his character, like in that I liked that he was a good person, right? Like I liked that he was kind and like thought of others. I wish he wasn't so stereotypical, but like it's such a shame to see someone who seems to have a good heart be treated so poorly. Mm-hmm. And I'll add to this too that like her kind of um, disregarding behavior around Dex, like while it doesn't appear the same way, it does kind of happen with Dory too, where she just kind of gets ignored, you know, and like she uses the information she gets from her without giving her credit really ever and doesn't really go out of her way to involve her and like in that i think contributes to such a tense relationship between dory and tuesday for a minute that i kind of thought the book didn't need so just generally tuesday's not good at being people's friends and 
I think she stopped being friends with people when Abby died, honestly. Yeah, which makes sense. Like, with the Abby stuff, it seems like she got to a point where she just emotionally cut herself off Mm -hmm. for the rest of her life until this point. Yes, yeah. And it's like, fine, right? But people don't have to, not accept, but like, people don't have to continue to be patient if you're acting cruel. Mm Mm-hmm. Even if it comes from you being in a place of hurt, they don't have to put up with that kind of behavior if it's hurting them. That got unintentionally very deep. Yeah, no, I agree, though. I feel like in this, it makes sense because everybody kind of has something going on, mm-hmm. right? But there is a limit still. There is a line. And I think after 10 years of a one-sided relationship and then this <laughs> kind of happens, like you finally find a relationship you think is good and you're turning your life around, right? You realize your job isn't good. You want to do something else. Like you're trying. And then you're who's supposed to be your best friend, your only friend. Like her life goes to shit. And like you try to be there for her. And then she just shits on everything you're trying to build. And it's like, what's the fucking point, dude? Mm -hmm. Like I can be happy about this thing and help you. And you don't have to tear me the fuck down. You know, I do not need to be down there with you when I'm trying to help you up. And like, he's actually like doing well for once. I don't know. It seems like this is different than the other cases, right? Like he's, he seems to be thinking more, even though it was kind of a love at first sight thing. And I don't love that, but like, he does seem to be thinking carefully about this and trying his best. And like, she's going to try to shoot down his one moment. It's just not, it's not right. Yeah. So she does this thing. So this, I, I don't remember if this was the next day or when it was, but she's like, I don't know, where was she even she was like walking home or something i don't remember but she sees lila in a cafe i believe like through a window and like maybe bert or she assumes bert is there one of those two and makes eye contact with lila and then dips she just runs as like fast as she can as far as she can away from the place where she saw her i why <laughs> i just didn't understand this at all yeah i think it's because like Tuesday was having a breakdown and like she, I guess she wasn't sure who she could trust or talk to in regards to the game and like what was going on with Archie. And Lila is so shockingly chill about that because I would be so thrown off by that like weird behavior. I, I don't know. It just and Lila I think even smiles at her through the window when she sees her and she does that like this is also where I got deeper into my upset about the nicknaming behavior in this book because and I said something like it earlier, but like if you feel like you are in a comfortable enough level with this woman you barely know to call her by her nickname, then you don't just run away when you see her. That's unearned familiarity that you using that nickname. And it's the same way with like everyone using Rabbit, even though it's mentioned once that that's a nickname that some people call him, as though everyone is so familiar and knows him so well. It just doesn't. It doesn't make sense. It's unearned closeness and and familiarity between characters who don't know each other yeah it also felt weird for like tuesday to be the one like using this nickname like these nicknames sometimes because she's not supposed to trust anyone yeah she's not supposed to have friends it's like do you want a closed off character or not like does she trust people or not like you can have some contradiction in a character but like if you're gonna have her instantly trust certain people just don't have that be a character trait for her yeah and also, there's a way to portray closed off, but still being friendly. Like, I'm friendly, right? But I don't, people at my work, for example, like, they probably know nothing about my life because I don't talk about it. Like, you can be closed off, but still amicable. Right. And I feel like that's a good balance, but then you don't have the goth character, right? So it's like, but does she need to be goth? Like, you also don't need to be goth to be into ghosts and, like, the occult. It just felt like an aesthetic was attempted, but it it didn't actually make sense. Yeah, I don't know. The whole for me, the whole nickname thing was just like the author made a choice that everyone gets a name and a nickname, and that had to be, and that had to be how it was, and that had to be how it was displayed, right? Like the only person who this happens normally for, well, there's two people who happens normally for, and that's people whose nicknames are actually like normal. (laughs) So that's Dex, which is Poindexter, which unfortunate, and Ned, who. I actually don't remember if they do give him the full name, but actually I think they do. I do think they say his full first name at some point, but yeah, otherwise it's just like, it feels like a game. Like it's, it'll it'll be cute if all my characters call each other by nicknames as opposed to like, there's a good reason for introducing 
both a full name and a nickname as opposed to one or the other. Literally, everybody does have a nickname, don't they? Mm -hmm. Even Tuesday's father calls her Mooney by her last name. By her last name, name, which is his last name. Which is crazy. (laughs) And then Abby calls her Tues, but at least that's an abbreviation that makes sense. Right. That's so, yeah, it's so weird. That feels like an attempt at an aesthetic. Yeah. But yeah, it doesn't actually mean mean anything. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Brief Tillerman lore, I suppose, uh, that Tuesday finds. The Arches own the house. I guess we mentioned this already. Arches own the Mm -hmm. house, was bought by NALLC, which is Nat's company, uh, which was then bought by Vince's company. I'm, I'm assuming... Nat either didn't care for some reason or just didn't know it was Vince's company. Because my assumption is Nat put Edgar's body there. Mm -hmm. With the well coming into play, That's I'm I'm assuming that's where he ended up. Also, if that well is literally providing water for the house, big problem. I mean, yeah. (laughs) But we were right. Tillerman House, important. It was in the beginning of the book. Comes back at the end of the book. Because that's our final destination for the end of this quote-unquote puzzle. Oh, God, I'm going to get upset again. So, yeah, we'll start with Tuesday and Archie um, are co-located in the house in the basement. And they end up, I'm just trying to decide what specifically to say, because they end up hearing a ticking noise, or at least Archie does. And maybe I was a little confused by this, but they do they find the pocket watch here? Or are they, is this when the wall comes down? I, I'm actually like blanking on the exact order of events in this part okay so they're in the basement together they see a portrait of a woman with like dark hair i think it is i was like that's kind of poet <laughs> uh, it's constance newsflash they do see edgar's pocket watch hanging on the wall and like in the subway tunnel the bricks are kind of loose so they can knock them down and i think that's where the well is gotcha okay so it's the well that's on the other side yeah, and then this is where the whole seek well thing suddenly makes sense for some reason, even though they don't find out anything about that well, actually, <laughs> in the end. Yeah, they don't actually do anything with it. I mean, I think you can just kind of infer, but yeah. Well, yeah, there's nothing is confirmed at the end of this book, really. So, And then, okay, so Dex is also in the house and is the first one to see uh, Nathaniel. I was low-key like, Dex is dying here. <laughs> That's what I thought was going to happen. <laughs> I was like, oh no, our, our boy is done. Uh, but that, that's not what happens. Nat, Nat uh, plays it cool for <laughs> a bit first. And then there's like this whole other crew of people, Dory and, and all these people who we either just met in the last chapter or are literally meeting right now. Supposedly, all of these people are in the house for a reason, right? Like they were obviously chosen by interview, but they like start to talk. The main crew that's all together kind of start to talk about like why it is that they what role they may have to play, why it is that they're in the house, what special skills they bring to the table, <laughs> basically, while while these other folks are, like, still not even in the main room. Right, like, it's uh, all of the people together. It's Dex, Tuesday, Archie, Dory, Ned, Cass, Lisa, Verena, Colin, Marcus, Alex, Trudy, Nat, slash the woman Nat knocks out. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so 13 intended, 14 actually. Yes. Like, Dory gets the Earhart goggles, which seem to allow her to see certain symbols. So apparently that's why she's there. Doesn't make sense. Anybody could wear those goggles, Mm. but fine. Verena, I think... She had some weird, unique knowledge, right? Yeah, I think it's difficult because they're still thinking in the puzzle. Like, how do we solve this? Why are we here? Mm -hmm. Verena, apparently, because she works in antiques, can maybe figure out the Tillerman aspect of things both in the puzzle part of this and in the job interview part of this. I can't remember if it's Cass or Lisa, but one of the black cats is like, I'm here because I can get people together and lead them. It's like, I'm just a leader. Yeah. Yeah. Colin and Marcus, because of their history with like building and construction, shit like that, like stuff that seems to matter in the puzzle, maybe, but actually doesn't. It's really for the job interview part, but nobody knows that yet. So it's, strange to have the characters be like i'm here for this i'm here for this when none of that actually matters because there's no puzzle yeah and even if there was a puzzle that's none of that would make sense still yeah <laughs> you know but yeah we we get like a, a a roll call basically um 
for no reason, but I guess we're trying to justify why people were chosen. <laughs> right, because we had to fill 12 or 13 slots, so. Yeah, it's in like an awkward way to do it. Yeah. And then, okay, yeah, and then this other thing, too, is not only d is Nat there, but Nat decides that he's going to call himself Archie, <laughs> and then Archie is like, cool, I see you calling me, calling yourself me with a me calling myself you, which is dangerous, because I'm like, uh, if, like, something happens here that proves that Nathaniel is the one who killed your father, you're Nathaniel right now, so <laughs> that was kind of dumb, but also, like, it doesn't actually do anything. It doesn't matter. It was confusing for no fucking reason. Like, <laughs> nobody knows Nat as a killer in this house. Like, why would you introdu introduce yourself as Archie? Yeah, I think it was it was just for cover just in case. But, like, from a writing perspective, it made no sense because it doesn't matter. Yeah. And also, nobody's freaking out that Nathaniel Arches is there. So, obviously, people don't give a shit. They either don't recognize him or they don't care. So, it's, it's like, what's the point? Mm -hmm. But also, you would think if anyone else, well, I guess not. I'm like... Are other people not doing research on stuff enough to know that the arches might have something to do with this? Why would they, though? I, just because of the connection. I don't know, like them being neighbors or something. I don't know. It just feels like there'd be something. It just It's hard for me to believe that Tuesday is the only one who can figure this stuff out. But, you know, I guess we're supposed to believe that. Yeah, but the only reason Tuesday has any, like, knowledge of, like, it mattering between the two of them is because she thought she knew Nathaniel Arches. And was working with an Arches to solve this mystery. So obviously they were involved or at least interested. So their history would matter. For everybody else, though, they might like know they were neighbors. But like, why would anybody care yeah, that they were neighbors? So, I mean, it un it's understandable. Nat's supposed to be fucking famous as hell. Right. So maybe they would recognize him because of that. But obviously nobody gives a shit because nobody mentions it. Yep, it's irrelevant. So then they go to this. Okay, so Dory identifies a symbol on the ground with her goggles, and this like kind of kicks off the end sequence of what they are supposed to do? Question mark. Who knows? Because Who it's knows? like hard to tell what Vince did and didn't know about this whole setup. I don't know why what comes next would possibly work, and also like why that would signify the end of a game. But I guess we'll get into it now. So. There's effectively all these pedestals, which had objects on them, I think, but I don't know how much of the object part was relevant. And each player was supposed to line up to a pedestal, right? Yeah. I it, it didn't seem like there was much of a reason to, because the only one that really mattered was that Dex had a microphone on his, and there were speakers in all of the other ones. And all that seemed to really matter was that Dex needed to sing, or the group of them, I guess, needed to sing so that way the speakers would shake loose some loose wall and reveal this art piece that was behind the wall is that right <laughs> <laughs> i think basically the pedestals were like the 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 clock right yeah uh, so there were 13 because one had to lead them dory is the one doing so mm, and not the person who said her whole job was to lead people but go on i know i know so she's at the top of the stairs in my head Everybody did have a certain object, or they were supposed to, because, like, Dex had the microphone, Tuesday had the tarantula. There was other weird shit there. There was, like, a fucking baseball bat for some reason. I don't know who that was for, but thank God it was there so Nat could beat people fucking up. <laughs> that wasn't explained very well, but in my head, they were supposed to move their pedestals to a certain location to match these symbols that Dory could see. But that wasn't explained very well. And also it didn't matter because Dex figured out his was like a working sound system. And then they did karaoke for an hour. Imagine being like in the middle of solving a puzzle and you're like, karaoke is the answer. Like we're going to stop everything we're doing and just do karaoke. And it was the and answer. It was, yes. Which is why like I don't understand why there's 13 people here. Yeah. And it is confusing because if the walls were up and hiding the art then how much did Vince know? Like, maybe he knew about some of the art, but did he know the karaoke would bring down the walls? Yeah. Like, did you test this before you did, before you made it the game? Did he know the ceiling would fall down and reveal all of this gold and silver? Questionable. And also a hazard. Yeah, but then that's it. They're like, oh, this is the end of the game. Like, we solved it. It's like, what did you solve? Yeah, like, and 
it was ve- it's not like there's a little message from Vince at the end to be like, good job, you did it. Like, I wouldn't believe that that was the end of it. Right. Yeah, because nothing was done with the pedestals. Nothing was done with Tillerman herself, who seemed to be the main focus of this puzzle because it's her tomb. They're in her tomb. Mm-hmm. They don't even explore the rest of the house. And we don't actually get confirmation that Vince knew about the art or the gold. But I think we infer that he did. But then why? Why is this the solution to unveil it? And the reward here, like the figuring this out, doesn't even line up to Vince's character either. (laughs) Like if his whole thing was like getting rid of wealth and like being imaginative, like finding gold (laughs) is the solution to that sort of puzzle. Yeah. Finding an expensive piece of art is that the solution to that puzzle. Like that's not very imaginative, right? It's not any of the things that Vince has been displayed as so far, imaginative, whimsical, or occult. So I don't understand, like, why that would be the solution to this puzzle. It's also because, like, there isn't a clear end to this puzzle because it gets interrupted, question mark, because Tuesday decides to antagonize Nathaniel, Mm. who's playing along for, like, an hour for some reason. He's just kind of vibing while while they do karaoke. I don't understand it, but that's happening. And Tuesday is just, like, being intentionally, like, antagonistic to this man that has killed someone. And I'm like, first of all, there are children here. And you know this guy's a murderer, or you can assume so. Honestly, when the ghost in your head tells you to stop and you still don't, like... (laughs) Yes. Oh, and we haven't talked about Abby, like, at all. But we'll get there, I guess. talking to ghosts part of the book. And it's like, I guess this is supposed to be, like, a very brave... I'm an independent woman. I can like fight my own battles type of moment. It's just dumb. But the issue is it's also exactly what Vince wanted. Yeah. He wanted somebody there who would antagonize Nat so that Nat would go freaking crazy. And and Nat does. (laughs) He grabs the baseball bat and starts attacking. Mm -hmm. And instead of anybody helping Tuesday, Dex gives her the umbrella he has and they sword fight in this hall up the stairs yeah dude the fact that everyone's just standing and watching and like someone calls up like i called 911 it's like cool this is happening right now <laughs> like right and there's even like a bodybuilder there yeah that's right for I some reason about that there's like the whole and Hulk he dude. doesn't do anything and archie is having like a mental breakdown which understandable i suppose but that is not addressed or dealt with in any way in this book so he's just sitting there in silence while his maybe girlfriend, friends with benefits partner is getting beat the fuck up by his brother. Yes. And there's no payoff for that scenario, <laughs> by the way. And Dory is the only person that goes to help. <laughs> yes, this literal child. Nobody stops her. <laughs> and Duze is so afraid for Dory, as anyone would be, I feel like, because this is a fucking murderer. And... Tuesday gets her leg bash, whatever. And the resolution to this is congratulations, go surreal. We did it, everybody. It's true. Because uh, Abby shows up. Yeah. And pushes him off the balcony. <laughs> Which, thank Kills goodness. Him, question mark, maybe? Yeah. Oh, that's what I mean. Nothing in this story is resolved. Like, we don't. And in the moment where we could, like, Emer- like she's talking to Emerson and trying to figure out. She's like, you know what? Some things just don't need questioning or whatever it is that she says. I'm like, girl, this is the only part of the story I want answers. Right, because this this go in different directions, right? Either he's still alive and he got up and he did run away, which means he's still out there. And it's like, then what do you do, right? Because he's definitely going to fucking come for you, right? right? Or he, he was alive but unconscious and he was dragged to the basement and thrown in the well. Mm. Or he did die and he was dragged to the basement and thrown in the well. <laughs> And for some odd reason, nobody fucking saw a thing. He Houdini'd his way out of the situation, yep. or he was dragged out of the situation, and there were 13 people there, plus police, plus probably ambulance, and nobody saw anything? Well, the craziest part is, like, Vince, Vince set this all up, and this is the same man who was like, we should put a recording device in a watch in order to catch Nat. And it's like, you had a whole house and you couldn't bug it even a little bit, like not a single camera, <laughs> like one, I guess the watch was around again, but it's probably not doing that anymore. Like it, 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 they were in the whole game of catching a criminal and 
did it worse the second time. Yeah, and this is just like only added to the mess that was this puzzle because it's what was the solution here? Lila clearly knew Nat was going to show up to the house. That was like the intention, right? And so you needed somebody there that would anger him enough, which I'm assuming was supposed to be Archie. And so Nat would blow up and try to kill Archie, but it ended up being Tuesday. So what's your hope? That he does kill Archie? Right. Clearly no one was going to stop him. Right. The only reason Nat was stopped was because of a fucking ghost. Yeah. I mean, otherwise he would have literally murdered Tuesday. Yes. Like, and probably would have murdered Dory. Mm -hmm. Like, and maybe even everybody in that right. fucking house. Like, this felt so sloppy and like, it didn't make sense. <laughs> it felt so like it shouldn't have happened, but it did because that's what the author wanted to happen. Yeah. Like, logically, this is not how the situation should have went. And I'm saying logically when we have a ghost involved, but even without the ghost, the whole setup to catching Nat just did not make sense and did not feel, it didn't feel real. Like, this is not how real people act. And this is not how real people that are supposed to be smart act. Mm -hmm. It was just a mess. And then they did something to his body. Either they threw him in the well or he did run away, but we don't get that answer. You could have just fucking killed him, man. Like... Just say he's dead, but you had to be spooky, like... Well, it almost felt like it was trying to set up a sequel or something. I fucking hope not. <laughs> Please, God, no. Yeah, that's that's the vibe I was getting. It's like, oh, this is... He's still out there. I'm like, okay, so this is unresolved because we're gonna have another Tuesday Moody story. So, we'll see. But, yeah, we should maybe talk about Abby since talking to ghosts is in the title of this story for some reason, so... First and foremost, we, I mean, Abby was real. Like, I think we decided this by the end of the first half of the book as a prediction that she would just 100% be a real ghost and, like, she was <laughs> maybe too real. But she also decides to, like, both save Tuesday but also leave Tuesday in doing so. I don't know what it was. Like, if this was her, like, officially passing on or something. Yeah, she says goodbye and... I mean, I don't think it's a full goodbye because we see a hint of Abby in yeah, like, the painting, the Tillerman portrait, yeah, in the glass. But I think instead of unfinished business with her own death, it became unfinished business with like making sure Tuesday was okay. So that was kind of the payoff for that. But I'm like, what the? F what was the fucking point? I mean, we never figure out who her murderer is, even though it's talked about several times throughout the story. You yeah, know, it, like this is uh, yet another unclosed loop here. We don't figure out what happens to Nat. We don't figure out what happens to Abby. Nat is presumably never caught in like <laughs> this whole thing was kind of for nothing, at least for the secondary game. We just don't get answers to anything. Yeah. And <sighs> truly just me being a fucking fool, as always, in the first part, I was like, Abby has to matter, right? Like what happened to mm -hmm. her? It's it has to be important. Like, yeah. why would you bring we it up? We sat there asking, what will be the connection between all of these people's deaths, right. including Dory's mom, too? There's, look at all this water happening. It must matter. <laughs> like, I guess the, for the well, if it were referencing the well. Oh my god! Holy shit! <laughs> <laughs> but it doesn't mean anything. Like, we don't know why. Because it's the the thing is, it's not even that Abby was just killed randomly, right? Like. That happens. You know, a girl goes out, she gets murdered. It'd be like that. The issue is Abby had to go out that night. Like, she was like, this is so important. We have to go out this night. It's raining. Like, why would you want to go out that night? I don't know. I have to go out that night. Tuesday doesn't want to go out that night. But it seems so important. It seems like this big thing. And now she's a fucking ghost who's hovering around. Sometimes, but not a lot. But sometimes. And it's like, okay, so... It's going to lead somewhere, right? It's going to be important, right? Right? But it's not. Oh. So it's like, why have the ghost at all? Yeah. Why have the ghost at all? No, I agree. It doesn't make sense to me that the book was named after this when the occult portion was the tiniest portion of the book, quite frankly. And it was unclear whether or not this book even was leaning into that or not. Like, the fact that she did end up being real at the end, we did call it. But, like, is it even in character with the rest of the book? Right, because it could have been what we also thought was happening before the confirmation, which was the ghosts was more of like a, a, a grief response, yeah. right? Like you have to deal with your past, you have to deal with your ghosts. And Abby's voice in Tuesday's head could have been her trying to stay with her friend, like a grief response, even having like a conscious, like that's not your voice, but that you take on as your friend's voice. And like, it could have 
dealt with that more, which probably would have aided Tuesday's character and actually given her anything interesting. Mm. But no, we decided to include this paranormal bit, but then also not do anything with it. Because Abby doesn't even get to solve her murder. It doesn't matter. Like her, the death of this young girl is pushed aside (laughs) for the story of these men. (laughs) If we want to take it down that route, like Abby doesn't matter in this. All she does is help kill Nat. It's just like another person for Tuesday to use. Yes. Yeah. And we obviously get hints from Archie's point of view that Tuesday is talking to Abby more. Even he notes that, that she's like talking to herself and like having conversations. But like, we don't get any of that in Tuesday's point of view. So it's like, what conversations is she having? Like, yeah, especially because it's what we do get from Abby isn't super deep. Usually it's just like what maybe is supposed to be like audience insert commentary onto things that Tuesday's doing. It's nothing ever like super thoughtful. Yeah. Some thoughtful shit she gives is like, don't be an idiot and antagonize this murderer. (laughs) And Tuesday does it anyway. So it's like, what's the fucking point? Like any of their conversations we are not privy to. We see from another person's POV. It's like, why even have them? This is like the one chance we would have had to actually see what friendship for Tuesday looks like. But like, like many other things in the story, we're just told to accept that Tuesday and Abby were best friends and that that was good because Abby's dead and we don't get that development and we don't really get a lot of flashback either. So, right. We also get a weird thing about witches. (laughs) That seemed useless. Yeah. It also, it felt also like stereotypes like you have girls from salem who use Ouija right, boards. Right. they must be witches like i'm like sorry first of all no that's not how that works shut the fuck <laughs> up but that also felt like just an inserted aesthetic yeah but they tried to make it deeper with tuesday in the end of the book being like my best friend was abby she was a witch dex you're kind of like a witch too it's like he's a why is he a witch because he doesn't fit the norm of society like that's so i feel like it's the only reason salem was introduced absolutely but it's like, why bring up witches at all? Like they are, they're actually practicing yes. witches that do shit because it is, you know, it's a faith. You can't just call people witches because they're a little weird. Like that's not how it works. I guess the intent was like, you have some magic inside you, you know, you're special, but it's like, mm. okay. I do think it was intending to be like, not just special, but off kilter. Yeah. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah. But it's like, that's not. It's like a thing. You 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 can be a witch. Yeah. But that doesn't mean you're weird. <laughs> like, those are not the same thing. Also, um, there's like a big deal made of the whole, like the much worse capital letters. Yes. Which was just like Tuesday, like busting into the police station and then having to tell everyone that she hears Abby's voice in her head, which on its own is like, this is underwhelming. But I'll give credit that the fact that she was treated like a little crap, like a little piece of crap for the next year of her life i get why it was so terrible yeah because it was a mix of people obviously thinking she's crazy but then also like pitying her which can be very terrible it sounded awful but just like (laughs) the event itself wasn't that bad (laughs) as far as like getting caught in the police station i was like all right like this is not but yeah like i was like man like that period of her life does sound really shitty she did make it sound like it was an event yes though yeah no for sure because then it was like it did feel a bit of a cop-out and she was like it was much worse because of this it was much worse because of that and it was like a list of all the things that made that part of her life bad but yeah but it had been built up as an event so it felt just like a oh it's deeper than it looks but it didn't feel super it didn't have that payoff yeah yeah i mean obviously still a terrible thing to happen it affected her for a long time but (sighs) abby just should not have been a fucking ghost i'll say it yeah i almost can imagine a version of this story that would be much more interesting with abby in it like for real where tuesday actually has a real friend (laughs) yeah she would have to know how to have one first um, I guess the only other thing we didn't talk about storyline wise is, well, I mean, we mentioned it if we wanted to get more into the Emerson thing, but we could also just move on, <laughs> like the them at the hospital. Yeah, it's, I mean, Emerson just is like, I don't know if she says it, but, or Tuesday might figure out that there's like a blackmailer because somebody has to control the game inside the game. Mm-hmm. It's basically two women who think they're smarter than everybody else in the room <laughs> having a conversation. Yeah. It, it was funny that it was like, oh, there's a banker, but there's also a blackmailer. Like, that's like a normal board game role. <laughs> and also, like, this was nothing like a board game. So <laughs> calling him the banker was dumb. It was arbitrarily because of, like, they played Monopoly together. And I'm like, 
it, again, it was an aesthetic mm, thing. Like the author was. just wanted a cool name for like what the person was doing. Yeah, just like Rabbit and, and the Alice in Wonderland thing too, honestly. Right. It didn't make any sense. Um, so yeah, it was just, and then like with that Emerson portion too, it was like, it was kind of cool to learn that she was secretly involved with things. Cause I think it was the thing we knew the least about. But it's it, then it just also like double confirmed that it was just rich people being rich, doing rich things, <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, like you also overcomplicated the thing. Yeah, because obviously they have the footage of Nat killing Edgar, but the idea is they can't use it because Archie's mm. there, right? Um, and even if they hate Nat, they want to protect Archie. So that does complicate everything. But I mean, they're rich. How, how long are they really going to jail for? You know, <laughs> it's a good point, too. Didn't even think about that. Yeah, I feel like they, they're they controlling it this way, but they could have controlled it in other ways, too. So, yeah. Yeah. And also, like, Dory comes around and is like, we, like, told the story a certain way because we didn't want you to look bad. That's, at least, that's how I interpreted what Dory was saying. She was like, me and the other participants were like, we're, we're going to tell the story a certain way to, like, not put Tuesday on blast, which effectively means also helping Nat be covered up. Oh, because the, the idea was, like, something had happened and... Tuesday got hurt because of the house or something like right it was an accident yeah like what do they think happened to Tuesday <laughs> like what is the what do the doctors think happened to Tuesday like she was clearly there's no way that people don't know she was beaten and also 13 people watched her get beat well yeah one of them did it but 13 people watched her get beaten and they all decided it was a good idea to not mention that yeah I guess it's like a do you really try and swing the net arches tried to beat a woman with a baseball bat scenario there's literally so many of them <laughs> i know but like two of them are children you know like uh -huh. i i get the vibe like trying to make it simple especially because nat's disappeared like i in my head what happened is nat was fucking murdered i think everybody in that house either looked away or threw him in that fucking well like I just feel like there's yeah, no... Yeah, like they're all involved and that's why they're not saying anything. There's no way he just got up and left and nobody yeah, noticed. Yeah, like, sure. that's impossible. I kind of just thought like Emerson came, honestly, right? Like to take care of his body. Like, because doesn't she reference being there? Yeah, because they must have been on site, like Lyle and like yeah. Emerson and stuff like that. So them getting there and like <laughs> paying off or like convincing all these people to go with a certain story, I believe that too. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, that makes me feel better about it honestly because i was just like how are we not how is this not closing out <laughs> but i wish it was more explicit if that's what happened honestly yeah they should have just been direct about this kind of stuff mm -hmm. is it like the one part of the book i wanted to be direct was the end <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah well speaking of the end maybe we should <laughs> start ending our talk here and maybe move into ratings yeah do you want to go first <laughs> yeah I, i'll go first <laughs> I'll start off. I think I I think I'm gonna stick with a three for this book. I definitely felt like there was a lot of things I wanted better. There was a lot more I was expecting from it. I think it would have been lower if I hated the romance a little bit more, but I just ended up feeling a bit neutral about it, which I, I think is probably as best as that can go. So it, it, I don't really I don't know if I ever like went back and looked at the genre tags and stuff, but like I was definitely expecting more mystery and more of the puzzle game and yeah, so since it missed out on those things, like that's why I'm like down down at a three. I also just didn't end up liking our main character, right? So I think it's okay to have a a questionable main character. I don't don't think this was the version of that that I liked. So, um, so it could have been worse, could have been better. It's a three. So for me, oh boy, <laughs> we had high hopes at the beginning of this book. You know, I was feeling good about it. I genuinely, I don't know what to rate this book. The first part of this book was good. There were good things happening. So it's kind of like episode 13 in that regard. Like the beginning of the book was interesting. Episode 13 was more interesting because of how it was written. Um, I think that really helped it out. This is just so contemporary and normal that it's actually worse in my head because it's just like, it's boring. And I say this as somebody who doesn't really read romance. So please keep that in mind. Like straight romance, boring as hell for me. Uh, you've probably picked up on that fact with me complaining about every relationship in this book <laughs> because nothing felt like it had substance. Um, the Kingdoms was also a bit disappointing and toxic, so it matches this book in that regard, but the Kingdoms didn't make me as angry for some reason. Like, I just felt nothing. Yeah. Maybe because we were stuck in the middle of the story, 
something about it just hit different. This was an entire story that was good in the beginning when it was about the puzzle, which is what we were promised, and then was disappointing and just made me very upset, (laughs) basically, to put it simply. Because, like, it turned into a book about their relationships, which is something we were thinking might happen in the first part. At least I think we were. The puzzle didn't matter. It was about the relationships. And it was about relationships that weren't well-developed and just weren't good. Like, they just weren't good. I don't know what to rate this. (laughs) I guess it's closer to a two. That's what it sounded like. But, like, the more I think about it and, like, what all the relationships mean and like really digging into it and how angry I felt. Part of me really wants to give this a one. Oof. But because of the puzzle in the beginning, I think I'll go with a 1.5. Oh, wow. (laughs) (laughs) But I'll probably rank it like a two on like Goodreads to even it out. But it is somehow it is lower than a two. None of it made sense. But the first bits were pretty fun. Mm hmm. Yeah, we got a third of a puzzle in this book. <laughs> yeah, thank God. So yeah, I'm thinking a 1.5, maybe a 2. A 1.5 because of this conversation we've had, but probably closer to a 2. It is sometimes, you know, given that we, we come in, come on to this podcast with a pretty critical eye, it can be hard to <laughs> to not feel that way. I feel like sometimes by the end of the episode, I'm like, man, I, I don't like it as even as much as when I came in the episode. <laughs> yeah, it's me. I bring down the vibe, to be honest. Yeah, it's all right. I think it's good to be critical and, and have all these conversations. And also, I think it's all right to have high standards because <laughs> there's a lot of books out there and there's going to be things that we really, really like. And so there should be space for them at the top of the scale. Yeah, it'd be better if books were marketed as they actually are. Then I wouldn't be disappointed. That was a big downside for this one, for sure. <laughs> well, we must as always, end on some good vibes. <laughs> so uh, would you like to go first on that, Taylor? It's going to be a bit of a broken record. The only good vibe I can think of is the puzzle. Dory figuring out like the tunnel clue and it actually leading somewhere substantial with a clue. This is starting to get a little messy, but you know, we'll, we'll keep on going. Led to the message, the underground theater, which had another message to the card, the playing cards, like that felt exciting. And that felt like the good start, like a good start for what was going to be like an epic treasure hunt. (laughs) I repeat those words every day. So I had high hopes and those parts were good and fun. And that's my good vibe. For me, I would say, given my fears about where the Tuesday Archie relationship might go, I was pretty satisfied that the book didn't feel the need to end with them being like, we're super duper in love and like we're spending the rest of our lives together and like, you know, kind of more like I think stereotypical romantic endings. Mm -hmm. Not to say that they like it's clear that they're still seeing each other and stuff, but but it was nice that it didn't have that solid uh, of all the things. There were many things in this book that didn't resolve solidly, but this one I actually really liked as as something that didn't need to be super resolved and have a final like these two are going to be together if, if is more complicated than that tuesday and archie end up not really talking uh with like we don't get any more dialogue from the rest of the book which is like i mean you can probably have varied opinions on that but for me it was like yeah actually i i don't think i needed that to end the book the way i wanted it to end so i was i was generally satisfied with that um also i i thought i was going to mention it more throughout the episode and i didn't so i just also want to say i really love dory and i wish she was actually the main character of the book yeah dory also pretty good she was ready to play the game i wanted to see yes exactly could it have been a bit like you know in a darker direction uh with with her manipulating people sure right but (laughs) it would have been more exciting for sure (laughs) okay those are some good vibes i suppose um (laughs) if you have any of your own thoughts uh twitter is 50 50 underscore books and for next episode it's a bit of a weird one uh regarding range mostly because uh, neither of us have actually gotten the book yet. <laughs> so the book we're reading is Lake Lore by Anna Marie McLemore. And there aren't chapter titles. Or there are, but there aren't like numbered chapter titles. But counting the chapters, we're kind of just going to assume we're going to read up to stopping at what would be chapter 29, which should be a lore chapter. Uh, go up to but not including 
what would be chapter 29 lore. How many pages that is? Hopefully halfway. <laughs> but it, yeah, I, you know, this one's a gamble, but maybe we need something a little bit more chaotic. Yeah. And it'll be great, you know? I hope so. It seems very different from what we've done so far, so. So that's what we're doing next time. That was a ramble to get to the range. Sometimes they're clean, <laughs> you know? Sometimes it's yeah. up to this part. And sometimes it's this. <laughs> I'm just like, how dare the publisher do this? <laughs> we'll, de we'll deal with it. If you read a little bit more, a little bit less, it's all good. I'm sure we'll make that mistake. <laughs> so... <laughs> Yeah, it's. I mean, I'm not like it's not like I can really take notes in my version of it. So this will be fun. <laughs> Try out to just count it to see where I am. Yeah, we'll figure it out when we start recording, and I say something that you have no idea about. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> that'll exactly. be what that episode is like. <laughs> oh boy! <laughs> but it'll be fun. Taking here. Fingers yeah, crossed. Fingers crossed. It. Yeah. It seems like an interesting one. Mm -hmm. So yeah, lake lore. And that'll be next time. All right. Bye.